So this is how we will proceed today. First, um, before I start in the gritty, nitty gritty part, you may be wondering who I am, what am I doing here? So that I'll tell you about in the first point. Before you start sending applications, what do you have to bear in mind? And then I suppose that's why you'll send up here, how does a CV in Germany look? Of course, you can ask questions throughout the whole presentation, but um, I also saved 15 minutes for your individual questions. I, in the email that I sent around, I, rec I asked um, if it could be written if you brought a hard copy of your CVs. How many hard copies have we got here? Okay, it's just for your orientation. I don't think I will have actually time to go through them uh, with you, but if you want to make notes on your own CV, I think that really helps. Just the difference or little marks according to what I say. It's just a recommendation. Good. So I work in the Turingian Agency for Skilled Personal Marketing, concretely in the Welcome Center, Turingia. We are in Erfurt, just in front of the um, Erfurt Bahnhof, just in front of the train station. We are in charge of promotion for education, training and employment in Turingia. What are part of the services we have? An online job portal that I'll tell you about in the second half of the um, workshop. And then an online CV check service in English and in German. In German, automatically through the websi uh, website. In English, please get in contact with me beforehand. Send me everything first uh, uh, via email and then we can make an appointment. It might take a little, a little bit of time. And of course, the organization and participation in re regional and national job fairs. For example, academics that I'll let you know again in the second half. Concretely, the Welcome is a general service facility for international professional graduates and their families in Turingia. Of course, all our services are free of charge. We are open 23 hours a week. The opening hours, I'll leave them in a slide uh, at the end of the first part. There are some flyers here, but we're also available via email and telephonically outside those opening hours. I forgot to say my name, right? I'm Cobalonga González Puyol, okay? Um, as you may hear, I come from Spain, but I've been living in Germany already four years. I started this job uh, with, at the start of the Welcome Center, which is September 2013. I'm very, very grateful to be here, and as you may notice, we sit in Erfurt. What am I doing here? These two workshops are in collaboration, and thank you very much, uh, in to, with the FSU Jena and the Ernst Aber Hochschule here in Jena. Good. What is, the, what is the point of today? After today's session presentation, you will be able to identify the proper format uh, of a CV in Germany, how to write a basic CV. Uh, when seeking a job in Germany, you know to know what you have to watch out for. There's uh, maybe a couple of details that you may, if you already have applied, which you are familiar with, or if you're starting to apply or want to do it soon, that may be a good tip and identify, very important, what employers in Germany expect to read, um, which some of the points maybe we'll see later, I don't know if you agree with me, are sometimes regarded as type of information which does not belong in a CV. Typical CVs of um, other countries, which would be, for example, date of birth and place of birth or nationality. There is um, some, in some countries where there's a tendency to omit this information, but here it just belongs. Anyway, you'll, we'll see that now. Turning this last point around, um, it also means that you will see what does not belong in a CV, which I think that is exactly as important as what belongs in a CV. Good. Before applying, um, let's take a step back and see what I mean. <coughs> your CV, your application should uh, um, reflect should reflect your professional life. Private sphere so should remain private. Surprise, recruiters can Google and recruiters Google. So make sure um, you, the image that you want to portray of yourself in the internet or uh, uh, for the future job is reflected also in your internet pres presence. Keep track of your privacy settings, block whatever you have to block, just make sure you can't easily find a photo of you dancing happily around a pole somewhere. I don't think it'll make a very good impression. Yeah, it sounds funny, but the two photos that are there, it's actually photos that I, that I found of people when they were applying for jobs. It's very easy to find, especially if 
I don't know, you're applying somewhere where the friend of the friend of the friend has already done the internship, then you're probably through Facebook somehow connected. It's easier than you think. That's the whole point. Use an, a formal email. What do I mean with a formal email? Forget your princess 92 at something gmail.com. Um, does work okay when we were 14, 15, but it doesn't sound professional. Here's a question for you. Should you use your university email when you're applying? Why not? Fantastic. It expires um, after some time, and you need an email which you daily use. Um, I don't know if, uh, how often you check your university email, but when you're sending applications, you really need to be on top of them. Okay, and maintain this all. Also, if you're creating a new email, make sure um, a recommendation name, period, surname. If you're Maria Muller, it's probably going to be uh, already taken, but to try to keep it as formal as possible. Uh, and if you're starting out with a new email, just make sure that it's with an email system that you're familiar with to avoid like answering what you don't want to answer, sending something that you don't want to send. It sounds very basic, but it happens more often than you think. While sending applications, while preparing a CV, you have to be prepared to spend ample time preparing your CV, to write and rewrite your CV, to have somebody read through it, don't be shy, and to adapt each time your CV for each application, each for each position that you're applying to. We're only here seeing one part of the CV, uh, of the applications, that is the CV. But um, the cover letter is just as important. Unfortunately, we haven't got time to go through the whole thing, but the CV is the central document. Why is a CV important? The CV and the cover letter are the first contact with your potential employer. You're competing with other people, which are not there. Your CVs are there, so you're competing with other CVs. So the CV, your CV, needs to show immediately what you have, the relevant skills and aptitudes, the, and that you have the necessary experience. That means you're adapting, you're targeting, matching what you bring with the internship or job description. And it's also important because their CV is probably going to be used as a guide by the employer if, or potential employer if you get to the interview. As the old saying says, there's no second chance for a first impression. Good. What is the purpose of, C of a CV? I actually meant to put the second part of the text later. Now you have the answers in front of you. From your point of view, the CV for you is important because it will get you an interview not the job, that's a common mistake. A lot of people say, like, oh, my applications are failing, I never got a job, but you got, five uh, you got five interviews. So the CV is doing its main purpose. That your CV has to demonstrate that you have the skills, experience, and motivation. You, it's basically an instrument to sell yourself. From the employer's point of view, just do a first check, make a short list for further consideration. We want that you actually always make it to the second pile for their consideration. Good. Now we're getting to the nitty gritty part. Is it okay? Can you all hear me? I get the impression that I, I go loud and no? Fantastic. Any questions up until now? Fantastic. Then I'll just carry on. Um, good. How the CV is written? is just as important as what it contains. We already said, and I'm going to repeat this a lot, the goal of a CV is to present your skills and um, knowledge convincingly. Only if you yourself are convinced of what you're writing, you're going to be able to convince that you're the appropriate candidate to the person that is reading it. What do you need to watch out for? A clear tabular format. I'll let you know, or you'll see a couple of examples, actually. Um, the formulation has to be clear and concise, short, to the point. And what to include, how to do this, we're going to see now. Written applications are the norm in Germany, but also um, sending it via email. Important is that the cover letter and the CV are both in one document, if you're sending it um, via email, and that this document does not exceed, let's say, 4 MBs with a picture, with a, uh, quality, uh, with a good quality, whatever, but please do not exceed this uh, amount of MBs because some systems 
are just going to um, reject emails, for example, with, a f with that are mm, too heavy or too big. <coughs> Do you know this format? How many of you have used it until now to send applications? I've got bad news for you. Don't use it unless it's specified by the internship or job offer, okay? This is somebody somewhere up there that is trying to make Europe and decided a Europass. It's the Esperanto of uh, CVs, it doesn't work. It may work, some institutions actually ask for the CV in this format, but generally in Germany it's not regarded as the best um, formatting. It's very easy to use, it's very comfortable to use, but it's got too many colors, it's got too many subtitles. If you fill it out entirely, you'll have five pages and you need something short, punchy, to the point, clear, maximum two pages long. So the Europass is definitely not the correct format, at least in Germany, unless, again, it's specified in the internship or the job offer. Especially in European institutions, that is the case. Watch out. Good. As I keep saying, positive, sharp, focused, make every word count. You're going to have to keep it short. So you are going to have to really think about what you're writing. Don't use prose or poetry, use bullet points, okay? It's going to be in reverse chronological order. And when you're describing activities in an internship, in that university, in your work experience, try to use active verbs and avoid the use of a reader-friendly CV. Again, must, must be logical, avoids repetition. The logical structure will see now what is expected and the goal is to have all the key information easily available. No jargon and no acronyms. It's quite difficult for somebody that um, is reading a CV to know what AAPEASF means and you're not going to Google it. So make sure that it is clear from the beginning what you mean. Emphasize the aspects that match your resume and omit those aspects that have no relevance. And let's see a little bit about the presentation. Formatting. It has to be professional looking. That means just as important as the writing is the use of the white space. If you're going to print it, use very good quality paper not recycled, if you want to be um, paper friendly or tree friendly, um, send it via email. And use one single conventional fault if you want to go over the top two, but no more. And I've written here some examples. It doesn't really have to be always Times New Roman. Regarding the size, use common sense. Normally, 11, 12. <coughs> Just print it out, your CV, the first draft. You can read it. This distance, it's okay. If it's too big, just reduce uh, it a little bit much, a little bit uh, more, if not increase the size. Of course, headings can be bigger. You can use bold, but be careful with random bold, italics, and colors. Underlining is also pretty difficult. <laughs> so just use each of these emphasis resources sparingly. And capitals, unless they're in titles, avoid them. They can be a little bit ugly. I have the impression you're shouting at me. Okay. How long has a CV got, got to be maximum? I said. Fantastic. Good. General rules. It sounds very logical, but just in case, it has to be up to date. When you're applying, it has to be up to date to the date of today, and or the date that you're sending it, actually. How are they going to know that? At the end of the CV, you're going to have to sign and write your name and the date. I nearly forgot. Tabular form, what does that mean? On the left hand side, we're going to write the time frame, like this, for example, month, year. Date, so exactly, exactly the day, it's not important. You can also write the month out, but then you'll see that it takes up quite a little bit of space. So I recommend this format. It's going to be thematically structured in reverse chronological order. That means um, that the latest thing, so what you're doing now, comes up first. Um, this is structure. 
you'll see that the structure is quite fixed, but at the same time it's flexible. So you can move around the information as blocks in each part, so in the education, for example, or work experience, internships. You have to adapt the content under each bullet point to the resume to match the profile. Again, omitting aspects which are not relevant, don't be scared. Instead of making a long list, try to use examples. Presentation is just as important. Let's start with the CV. I have one example somewhere that you'll see later, but um, two pages with one exception. You can have one more page if you decide to use a cover page with a photo. If you decide to use a page, what information belongs here? The application position, so application for an internship as a researcher junior, for example. The application photo, we'll see them now. Name and surnames, contact details, including address, phone numbers and phone number and email address. Phone numbers, if you have two, how many should you write? I recommend one. And make sure that you're reachable under, under this uh, number, okay? And, well, just regarding the cover page, it's not a must, it's just an option. We will see two examples of a CV, one just the cover page of another and another one without a cover page. It's just to give you a little bit more of um, information. Of course, the cover page before the rest of your CV. Let's talk a little bit about application photos. I don't know if you're familiar with this term in German, Bewerbung photos. They are actually a category of photos and you go to a professional photographer and take them. Why do you think this is inappropriate? It's too much flesh. This one, selfies do not belong in a CV and definitely not one with a window behind. No need to say anything. And she probably looks very pretty in this picture, but it's still not an application photo. Application photos look, for example, like this. For me, at the beginning, it did look a little bit over the top. I thought I was like, I don't know, some kind of writer, a back of a book, which I never wrote. Uh, but this is what they expect. So you will see a couple of other examples throughout the presentation. It's an investment. It's not about being pretty or not. It's just trying to give a neat professional impression. And a professional, a neat, a nice professional picture invites you to read more. Any professional photographer, if you go and ask for Bewerbungsfotos, they'll charge you quite a lot. But they'll also guide you and make good photos. For us international students, well, I'm not a student anymore, but for us here in this room, application photos have one other advantage. If, did you receive any emails from me? No, good. Um, my name is Kovalonga González Pujol. If you hadn't seen me here, would you know if I'm a man or a woman? But would you have guessed just because of my name? No. Uh, a photo has also got the advantage I know who I'm talking to. Or it's just for an answer. Dear Miss, dear Mister, thank you very much for your application or we would like to invite you to an interview. It's just avoiding a small embarrassment if they address to you like dear Miss uh, Kutrapali and then you're a Mister when you get there. There's also another option to take application photos free of charge and that is in many recruitment events or yeah, job, job medicine. One of these uh, would be the academics that takes place on the th third, on the third of um, December, it's a Thursday. They are free of charge, the queue is long, I tell you also. You will see me there as well, not taking po photos, but just in front of the photographer is our stand. Um, it's free of charge, but make sure you bring your own like formal clothing. <coughs> yeah, this is not the only place where you can take, um, like the only um, recruitment event where they do that. Have a look in the internet. It's normally in the site program specified. This is of a cover page. 
Okay, this is another um, Bewerbungsfoto, another application photo, this time horizontal. And as you can see, there's the title, application for the internship position as a researcher junior where, and then the job reference. This was found in a job portal, for example. And then name, address, and contact details. For again, we have a cover page. Now we're going to see a CV without a cover page. This is uh, how the CV should be, should be st structured. Oh god, I don't know what went wrong there. The order, again, can change slightly depending on your previous um, practical experience or if you're a fresh graduate or you're applying for studies. But anyway, if you're a fresh graduate or if you're looking for an internship, what you put, you put first what you've done most recently. So that would be after personal information and tr uh, personal information would come education and training. And then after that, either work experience, if you have work experience, only internships or just experience in general, and then any other personal skills and competences. We'll go through them in detail one by one. So each, common, uh, each of the slides coming corresponds to the title of one of the subsections. I promise you that after we've seen every subsection, this CV example actually fits into two pages. Because I've done this presentation before and it's like, it's impossible. All that information that you have in the screen, that doesn't be just. I just cut out the section and it's, I mean, I'm, I don't want to cheat on you. It's two pages. Good. And at the end, I said it twice and I'm going to repeat it at least twice uh, throughout the presentation at the end of the CV, date and signature. People keep forgetting, that's why. Good. What belongs in under personal information? If you haven't got a cover page, this is the first thing that you would see on your CV. On the top, top right hand side, you would have the photo. On the top left hand side, you would have the rest of the information. The rest of information is full name, first name and last name, address, telephone number, email address, date of birth, DOB, I've seen several times written on CV, I said no acronyms, the date of birth, place of birth, nationality, if relevant, uh, marital status, and if relevant, visa status. Maybe some of you are surprised, I see a couple of nodding uh, faces. Hmm, that's a lot of information about me, which is not typical in other CVs. It's just what employers here expect. It's not that they want to do anything good, mean, or not uh, with this information. One point that may, you maybe say, oh, visa status, what has that got to do? It's just to avoid a rejection because of an insecurity from their side. Not that they think, oh, I don't know if you can work or not. Just in case, I leave it out. I don't want any trouble. As a student, you can work. And that's just giving them information. The same as, a, as if you're a fresh graduate from a German university, then you have 18 months at, uh, to look for a job. Good, this is an example. It would look like this. So as you see, there's a heading, bold and capitals, we went crazy with this one. And in this uh, case, another tip uh, for international students, if you're having a CV like this without a cover page, maybe it's also not a bad idea to separate name and surname. Because again, I have one name and two surnames. Some of my Mexican colleagues, they had two names and one surname. Germans can have 500,000 names and only one surname. So in order for them to be able to write, to address themselves to you correctly, just putting the information a little bit easier for them. Any questions up to here? And this is another typical um, photo, application photo. Yep. Um, let's say it this way. If I can read your handwriting in the attendees list, you'll get it via email. Maybe that's the motivation to write your name properly. <laughs> Good, yeah. Where's the list? Fantastic. Just keep it going. Other information which did not fit in this example was marital information. Unfortunately, if you're a woman, normally it's expected so like child, uh, child care insured and uh, visa state. Good. Educational training, fresh graduate, or looking for an internship, you're in your second year. This would be the next section, subsection. 
it is in reverse chronological order. Again, what you're doing now comes up in the first line. The dates on the left hand side, that's what we call tabular format. And what comes later? The name of the institution, city, an uh, institute designation, for example. Then the study program that you're doing, full qualification title. So if it's a Master of Arts, a Master of Science, a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor in, or please, that the name is the correct name, just as it would appear in your certification. And then you can have another subheading, major coursework, related coursework, other subjects. If you have a specialization, you put it in here. Specializations are one or two, it's not five. Then it's like relevant subjects. It's not a specialization. Okay. Again, you're, you can adapt this uh, to each application, maybe relevant coursework. If you're studying sociology and you are focusing on market research, then you will leave maybe other information out. Good. If applicable, and you've written already a title, a thesis, um, or thesis title, and then the full name, and if applicable, any semester abroad experiences. This is, okay, no idea. Um, depending on what you want to emphasize, you can either put it as a separate point, and then you add like Erasmus or uh, international um, year, or you can integrate it bachelor or your master as one other line. The same format you would use if you have pursued a vocational training, which is normally not the case among international students. Am I right? Good. We'll see an example now. Again, tabular. The only information that goes on the left-hand side is the date, the month and the year. It's the only information. You don't need any subtitles, position name, or I don't know, study program, that is clear. That belongs on the right-hand side. This is an example from education. So it's invented. You hopefully won't find a Willy Brandt University of Applied Sciences in Jena. Uh, just to give you an example. First line, again from formatting, bold, to make it stand out, is what the program is. Second line, the university. And then comes information that you can adapt. On the left hand side, see only the date. You don't write, for example, um, October 2015 minus till date, or you leave it blank. You write since the date that you started, okay? If it's still ongoing, that's important. The same in German. You wouldn't write until now, you would, you would write site. Egal. <laughs> I'll just continue in English. Now I'm going to get a mix up. Why did I do this little mark? I said formatting is just important, just as important. Use of spacing. This is, I think, 1.25 points between the lines. But then after, when we're changing uh, between two different subpositions, it's, I think, 10 points different. So make sure that the blocks are recognizable and easy to follow. You don't want it to look like a list of things. Good. Of course, you can alternate the order and write first the university and then the study program, but then you're going to have to do it like this throughout the whole CV. You have to make sure that whatever you do is constant. If you write bold, the first line, then bold throughout the whole CV, the first line. Avoid mm, random bolds, random italics. If you want to highlight something, make sure that it's there maybe on the first line on the second line, and things that are not that related, but you may pass, they come further at the bottom. Five bullet points, it's the maximum that you would write. Good. Question for you. Would you write the grades? Why not? I mean, I like your argument, but why not? Okay, that's seeing it negatively. I was going to um, say something more positive, it doesn't matter uh, what a, uh, for a grade you have. Um, we have studied abroad, most of us, and we now are getting familiar with the German system. So if I write a grade here, I'm going to have to explain to the person reading it what the point system is. And you need that space for really important information, which is your education and training, your knowledge, the, s the skills with you. If it says in the application, 
uh, somewhere in the internship description, I mean. Uh, excellent grades, then you would have to put it in. If it's not here, at least in the cover letter. But if not, just avoid problems and leave it out. Good. Any questions up to here? Fantastic. Yeah. For example, after 2012, uh, the starting is 2014. So in between of that, uh, we are going to include, for example, we have done work experience of two years. So we are going to include that or what? Fantastic. That's the point. I mean, gaps from three to six months are okay. Um, the rest have to be explained through, I don't know, further training, language courses, something. But this gap from two years will be explained in the following two slides, okay? The logical structure. First education, then uh, work experience. And then if it's well done, you will, set, you will add up all of the time periods and they will add up to like a timeline. If not, it wouldn't be a CV anymore, it would be a timeline. Good. Thank you for the question. Practical work experience, internships, it depends on what you have or what, how you want to, what you want to put emphasis on or this, the um, experience that you bring with you. You can name it one thing or another. There's no fixed title, okay? Important is, again, that they appear in reverse chronological order. So the last thing that has to do with work experience comes up first. The dates on the left hand side and then comes the full company name and location if it's in another country that's not Germany, country in brackets. The exact position description in the next line or the job title to say it like that and then come a short listing of activities performed, the main tasks, focus points, projects. One of the um, Okay, side jobs, you can include them in this section if your experience is limited, but you can also uh, have a different section, side jobs, okay? Important is, if they, if they have, for example, have to explain a time gap, then you put them in, but if you think it's not relevant for the job, you can also leave it out because there will be no gap. You will be studying in this time, so you're not expected to have been doing anything else. Good. Again, left and hand side, you will see it in the example now. One of the common errors, this is what actually I wanted to say before, when you do the short listing of the activities performed, is that people write what the enterprise does. No, it's what you did there, what is important. Maybe the results that you achieved, any training that you did there. Um, use action words, for example, accomplished, optimized, monitored, implemented, you designed, you consulted, you monitorized. And then how did you do this? I mean the perfect example or the perfect uh, way to describe the task that you did uh, that is with a lovely adverb before, demonstrably reduced, you effectively managed, you closely monitored, so the person knows exactly what you've been doing there, okay? Let's see an example. And as you see, this two-year gap, uh, this two-year um, position corresponds to the, t to the gap in education in the previous section, okay? First line in bold, the um, enterprise, then the position, and then a short description. In this case, it's a little bit too long, but it works. Uh, of the um, of the tasks that this person did. Again, use short bullet points. No prose, no poetry. Don't hesitate to remove old information to actualize whatever uh, the tasks. Maybe you have touched a lot at a project, or you worked in different projects and had different responsibilities. Emphasize those aspects that are relevant for the position that you're applying to. Okay. Um, don't artificially inflate your tasks and responsibilities. You're likely to be caught at some point. You're all students. Um, the person reading the CV knows that you're a student. So they don't expect huge projects and responsibilities. If you have them, fantastic. But there's no need to exaggerate. Remember, again, adapted to each application. 
this is an example um, of an internship. So we have another uh, heading and in case you don't need a position because it's clear that you're an intern. And what did you do? Important, especially for technical um, branches, scientific branches. Maybe you learned there um, or you put in practice some of your software skills, design, conceptualization. This would also be the place to put it, okay? Good. Then comes the personal skills and competences. This is to say that way nearly all the rest. But again, it still has to be organized and you're going to still have to describe a lot. For example, language skills. Always include your mother tongue. It's not probable that you're going to work in Spanish in Turinja, but it's always interesting to know. Foreign languages. Write them. Let's also defining the level of proficiency. Don't exaggerate them. They'll get to know latest in an interview when they try and speak to you in your lovely B2 French skills, which are actually a B2, an A2, okay? Software, computer skills, again, defining user level. Side jobs, uh, you can also include here as a different um, section, the same with volunteering would have the same uh, structure, institution, what you did, place and dates on the left-hand side. Not common, but it also can be military service or civil service if you did it as a separate item. Leisure and hobbies. There's a tendency to omit, but some recruiters like to have it there because you're not only a woman, you're also a person. But if you're going to put your hobbies or um, any activities that you like to do in your free time, make sure that they say something meaningful about you. <coughs> we'll see now. Any other skills and competence for their education, any trainings that you have, their certification, uh, how it would appear, certification, as well as your educational titles and other things will have to be uh, attached also in a document. And this is only relevant if you have a driving license, put it in 100% if it's part of the requirements for the job. If not, you can decide to leave it out. It's sometimes a, maybe an advantage, like, oh, okay, he can take the company, car, whatever. He has to drive around or something like that. Again, it's only, it's only useful if you actually have a valid driving license in Germany. Okay. Again, only the items that are relevant. You don't have to cram everything there. It's not expected. Good. Um, inside of these skills and competences, other skills and competences, you can also, if you're working very scientifically or towards, a, um, you want to do your PhD, maybe lab skills, for especially for IT um, positions, software applications, hardware, operating systems would also belong here. You can either group them or um, list them specifically. Okay, we'll see an example now. For their training, this person did parallelly to their job or before starting their job, uh, certification in CAIE, Computer Aided Designing. Um, it's included as further training. Again, if you haven't got something like that, you don't have to invent something. And if it's part of your university studies as a course, it would also not belong here, okay? Personal skills and competences, computer skills. In this case, it has been um, grouped into what the software does, and then listing the individual softwares. And on the right-hand side, very important, how can you use this software? Advanced command, good command, basic user. The same uh, with language skills. This is just um, an example, mother tongue, advanced user, basic user. You can use a little bit your imagination on how you would describe um, how well you can speak a language or if you understand. But make sure that the person reading it will also be able to understand it. I tend to avoid, but it's also okay, writing a comma after your description and then A1, V2, C1, the European uh, Common Language Framework. It, is, it can be that the person reading the CV is already familiar with this framework, this level of, how, of languages, but it can also be that this person isn't. So it's always safer to write a short description and then um, the um, B1, B2, whatever le level you have. 
This you can also check, for example, in LinkedIn or Ching, so social professional networks, how they describe your uh, linguistic competences, just as an inspiration. Good. And at the end, last but not least, I promised you I would say it at least this. Two pages, maximum. Date and signature belong at the end. Do not overload it, do not cram it. Cheating is not an option. I've seen a lot of CVs which are exactly two pages with two millimeters margin on the left hand side and right hand side. No. Okay. For example. Good. What does not belong in your CV? Which I see very often. Supervisor name and references does not belong in a CV. And um, I would not list any supervisor name or references unless it's specified in the job uh, or internship description. If you would have any recommendation letters, for example, you can put them at the end, you can scan them and send them. Objectives. Many, um, for example, American or English speaking CVs, they have objectives. Motivated, hardworking person aiming at a leading position in a global company does not belong in a German CV, okay? Three lines that you saved already. Untruths, it's a beautiful word for lies, exaggerating. No, you're likely to be caught. I mean, it's tempting to elaborate your skills, but if you're then going to be caught, it's really not worth the embarrassment. And of course, no typos, no grammatical mistakes. Have somebody read it, check through it, spelling, mis commas. We can all trust, more or less, um, the um, autocorrect system in our computers, but there's bound to be one comma too many, one space too much, two words put together. Check it, recheck it, and the best thing to do is to have somebody read it. Okay? Good. With this, I want to say I'm nearly done, and I promise you it was 45 minutes, and I'm reading the time. Everything that is on your CV must be true, but not everything that is true is on your CV. Again, it's this filtering this information. You can omit um, tasks, skills that are not relevant for, the, for this position, for this application, and put them in, in another. Basically, and this is the same for a CV letter, the golden rule is to write as much as necessary, but leave out as much as possible. You want to highlight those aspects that are relevant for the person reading it. Only those stages, activities, certifications that have at least an indirect connection to the position you're applying to are of interest to the potential employer. But why? Because you have five seconds to impress this uh, person. For a position, especially in international companies, you're going to be one of, I don't, I don't even want to guess how many CVs, just in case you get a depression here. Or maybe you're just the only one, but you still, that doesn't mean that you're going to get the internship. You want to get this first selection passed, and then the employer would probably read um, your cover letter. All this that I've told you, and a couple of you have sent me in your in their um, signing up for the event, a couple of questions. Do I match my CVs to the employer re uh, requirements? How? Uh, what do they expect? It's very simple. How do you match the, your CV to the expected requirements? Read the position. We'll see this in the second part. I'll, I'll help you identify a couple of points. And employers expect applications that are tailored to their job and internship offers. So don't waste your time by sending random application, mass applications. There's no such thing as a basic cover letter or as a basic CV. You have to really be prepared to invest the time. It's quality before quantity, and you will see that it pays off. Make sure you research the role, the organization, the department where you will be working. The more you know about um, the, the place where you want to apply to, it's not only an advantage, of course, for the interview, which is going to be a sort of exam, but it's also the best way to select, to leave out all this just-in-case information that you want to put in. Okay? If you put too much in, in the end, it's way too much and it does, it's not going to mean anything more. It's going to actually mean less. 
code. And um, when does it make sense to apply, for example? You have to at least meet two thirds of the requirements, let's say it that way. And that's also what I meant by random application. I'll just send this one, just in case, maybe they need me. Normally it states, I'm just speaking here figuratively, in the internship job description, we want a hammer and you're a screwdriver. You're the best screwdriver with the best grades, with the best internships. They want a screwdriver. You're not going to get the job, so you might as well save the time invested in this application. Okay? And very important is to know where you want to go. If you are not convinced with your own CV, the person reading it is not going to be convinced either. And when your CV is good, it's perfect. Let's say it's perfect. You also are going to have to transmit motivation with a cover letter especially that you want to really to work there. You have to give the employer the impression that it's the only application that you're sending. You probably have 20 open parallelly, but the person reading it has to get the impression that that is the application. Okay? Any questions until now or from now on? Sure. So the cover letter should be on the first page or on the third page? If you have a cover page, yeah. cover page, cover letter, rest of CV. If not, cover letter and CV. If you're doing, um, how are they called? Um, online, if you're using online application portals, so an enterprise has their own um, portal where you get a uh, password and something like that, the sections are very clear, so make sure you follow the instructions. Okay, but if not, as a general rule, cover letter and CV, everything in a one document, and the email, if you're sending an email, is not the cover letter. Email is just a text referring to the application that you have attached. Yep. Yep. So you mentioned the untruths, uh, which can be included in CV. So when we are supposed to, when we are sending the CV to the um, some or when we are applying to certain positions, are we supposed to also send the document which confirms that we really did some internship? It will be more persuasive for uh, this organization. Or because I hear that uh, some people when they send CVs, they also include all documents which con which confirms that. Uh, they really did uh, internships, they really had some trainings and so on. Okay, I know what you mean. Um, but it's also a lot of information, which... Definitely. Um, you are... I'm going to read out your question, and what you're talking about is an application portfolio. The CV is one part of the application portfolio. The application portfolio would contain a cover letter, the CV, and any other documents that have to be attached. Atta attached would have to be your latest um, educational certification. If you are enrolled at a university, the um, uh, grades that you are having that you have now. If it's a mandatory internship, a letter from your university stating that the internship is mandatory, and the certifications proof from other internships. That is a very German thing. Whenever you do an internship, whenever you have a job, you get an internship certification from the company, from the institution when you did the internship. It's a small letter, and I confirm that this person has done these tasks. Not everybody has them. If you have them, fantastic. But if you have them, and they're in Arabic, they're also useless, probably, in Germany. Make sure that they're translated into a language that the person reading it can, can read, okay? If you have them, Definitely, it's part of the application portfolio, but I didn't go with, uh, through it this uh, now. If you haven't got it, and if you have the chance to ask your previous internship tutor to write something like that, fantastic. If you haven't, then don't fake it. Good, very good question. Yep. Yeah, and my second question is for the references. Sometime in, the, in your CV, like say if I have to apply for PhD or postdoctoral studies, then I also have to give my references for the supervisors. Do I have to include in the CV? I'm focusing really on job search, internship search, the moment that you're applying for a PhD. 
a doc position, a postdoc position, your CV is going to look slightly different. Mm. The academic uh, CV is slightly longer or can be slightly longer. There are subheadings that are definitely not here, such as publications, mm -hmm. academic research. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure you dig onto that when you're uh, when you're applying for a, a PhD position, for example. Okay. okay. And never be afraid to ask. You can get the phone, follow them. You can write them an email. What do you expect? The enterprise, the institution, or as somebody that has done their internship there. What do they do? What do they recommend? And this happened, please, 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 please do not take the CV of somebody else that has worked there and to just change your name and your details because that was a good CV and it got them the job. I've seen that. It's strange. Okay? <laughs> it's like, okay, I've, s I've seen this before. Where? It's just a little bit, yeah, strange. Yeah, and the last uh, small question is when uh, you said about the cover page with mm -hmm. the CV. So is it your um, wish that you want to uh, include it or not? Or is it good always included? It's up to you. It's definitely up to you. Um, maybe you need a little bit more space because in this case, I want to write my volunteering activities because I ha didn't have to do with kids before, but the position that I'm applying to is actually something to do with kids or youth programs and then my volunteering experience is really necessary so I need two paragraphs more I put a cover page because then part of my personal information disappears or um, it's really a personal decision it doesn't work always sometimes it just says like send your CV and you can you can only upload two documents <coughs> CV and cover letter then you haven't got time, you haven't got place to, to have a cover page. It's definitely you. You'll, you'll end up seeing that some of them you'll send with an application uh, cover, the others without it. What does never belong in a CV is copying and pasting logos of the place that you're applying to or the place where you worked. I've also seen that. Any more questions there? Yeah, uh, some employers ask for uh, motivation letter in German language. How to deal with that situation? Because our is not so good. So we'll take a back. What would you do? You smile. <laughs> it works for me, but not for the company. Um, if the motivation letter has to be in German, it's probably because the job is in German. So if you haven't got the appropriate German skills, you're not going to get the internship position, so you might as well not apply and waste your time. German skills, are they a must? It depends where you work. It's definitely an advantage. And the moment you have a B1 German, B1 German skills, translate your CV and your cover letter into German. That was your question, huh? <laughs> Sorry, I normally include it in a slide, but I haven't until now. Again, it's normally written in the requirements. So if in the requirements it's excellent German skills and English skills and you have excellent English and French, you're not meeting one of the requirements. Yeah. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm like sort of the opposite of Christmas whenever I do this presentation. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah. one more. Um, for example, I finished my bachelor and I want to apply for a job because I don't know yet what master I would like to do. Should I say like, it's like... Well, I can't move. I, it's Sorry. a term in like, should I say I would like to do a master in my... Why? No, the I, mo it's the motivation to find a job. It's not the motivation after the job. Yeah. So you don't have, you can leave that information okay. out. That's your information. That's okay. your future. Because in the studies, like a part, you said there was a, something written like further Oh, studies. no, no, further education. Yeah. Further education, that means um, a certification that you've done somewhere, like a training um, for okay. software. And you did it in another institution and you have a certificate. 30 hours of design using, give me a program somewhere, somebody. Katja Fumpf. Okay. Does that exist? Something like that exists. <laughs> okay. And then you have a certification. Or you have, um, I don't know, you have done 25 hours in... I haven't got any ideas at the moment. Market research. Um, quantitative methodology. And then 
this title certification certifies you as an expert in something. Yeah, okay. it's not further education what you want to do in the future. In German, I don't know how good is your German? Weiterbildung? Mm, yeah. Good, then we stay in English. Okay. Fantastic. Any more questions? Fantastic. I have then. Ah, more. okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, in the for the level of proficiency for any language, so sometimes they ask like you have to write A one, A two, like B one, B two. Then do so. So for example, um, I know English. I can read English. I can write English. I can speak also. It's because Confirmed. I from my uh, childhood I learned everything in English, but I never gave any English test. So what to do in it this case? It doesn't matter. Did you do your university studies also in English? Yes. That's proof enough. Your certification is going to be in English. So then what should I write for the level? C1. Something like this. Uh, no. Okay. It's not native. It's not maybe uh, bilingual proficiency. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. And if you have a B1, I would definitely recommend you to send your CV in German. Definitely. Have always somebody read through it. It has to be authentic. It doesn't have to be Goethe's German. But they can read it and they'll probably feel more comfortable about it. And if the language, working language is German, then it's also a good place for you to train. And with this, I'm closing the session for 10 minutes. Okay? If you're still strong enough, we'll see us in 10 minutes here again.